hello everyone. Uh, welcome to a new segment from Collector Mania, uh, Tales of Rokugan. Uh, I'm here with Jake, and I don't know how to say your last name. It's uh, it. Chiminelli. Chiminelli. So I would have gotten it wrong. Um, <laughs> and of course, Kyle Hagen here. Um, I've been doing these reviews for a while now, if you've watched the channel at all. Uh, I basically have an addiction to L LCGs, and I buy them all the time, so... <laughs> Uh, that's why I'm playing L5R, and I actually kind of like the theme a lot, too. So, uh, Jake, why don't you give yourself a quick introduction here? Um, so I have been following the new L5R release basically since I think it was announced. Um, got a copy uh, from the Gen Con kind of release and, and dove into it and tried to like learn about uh, as much as possible. Uh, just because I really like the theme. Um, I really like all card games. I've played Magic, of course, uh, Pokemon, uh, digital card games like Hearthstone, Gwen, Netrunner, other LCGs like Netrunner, um, obscure weird stuff like <laughs> the Austin Powers card game and the Files like card game. Is CCG? Yeah, they were they were old. I used to have a hobby shop uh, down the road that um, when I like got like allowance money and stuff, I would walk to. And since I didn't have very much money, I would like raid there. We're getting rid of this failed CCG product <laughs> cycle, so I like bought all this like random stuff that I never learned how to play. Um, so I love all of the, you know, types of card games, um, board games, you know, tabletop role-playing games. Um, I had actually played a samurai character um, in 3rd uh, edition D&D &D because my friends invited me and I was like, can you, because I did uh, Japanese fencing at the time, and so they're like, what kind of character do you want to do? And I said, oh, well, can I be a samurai? And they were like, oh, yeah, and they like dug Sweet. out this, <laughs> yeah, they dug out this dusty, uh, <laughs> source book for samurais and ninjas and it was actually based on uh, Rokugan and the L5R world mm -hmm. um, so I didn't even know there was a card game but I was playing um, so when I heard that they were rebooting it I was just sold and uh, started you know reading all the news and speculation and dove right in so from the perspective of what we're going to be here like I'm kind of a little bit of a noob I've only played like maybe nine or ten games uh I really like the card games and I like the complexity because it reminds me of a lot of Warhammer Conquest. I think that was a great game and I really liked it. So I'm really excited to dig deep. Dig deep. Jake's a little bit more deep in the, the lore and the mechanics and the like the com I don't say the competitive, but like you have a better grasp on like the competitive nature of the game. I, I, I think I um, it's kind of I don't know I don't want to say a compulsion, <laughs> but um, whenever I get involved in a new game, I definitely like reading the lore. I'm one of those people that. Um, whatever game I'm playing, I'll like, well, the reason that that card looks like this, is, you know, because I've, like, read the wiki um, for hours. Um, and then the competitive side, I just, like, I kind of... I'm not a very competitive player, I think, but I like reading what competitive players of any yeah, game so I, Again, following the meta versus being part of the meta yeah. are two very different yeah, things. And, <laughs> I, and, I, and I do try to play any game like this kind of on the competitive side because... Uh, you know, uh, making your own decks can be fun, but I think sometimes you learn more about the, the way the game is structured mm -hmm. and mechanics if you kind of get outside your comfort zone and try to uh, play something that you don't understand. And so one way to do that is to, like, why did this guy win this tournament or why did this person build their deck this way um, and try to, like, dive in and, and yeah. learn about that. So, so like, net decking isn't always a bad thing. It can teach you things about a game. It's not <laughs> something to be, uh, you know, don't burn people at the stake for it. Actually, in LCGs like Netrunner, uh, I find net decking to be a fantastic way yeah. to learn how new metas are shifting. Especially, like with this game and Netrunner, have both have just large shifts in their their metas because so many cards have been released mm -hmm. or changed. That going to a website and looking at what people are playing is a great way to kind of grasp, yeah, like what's going on in the game. Yeah. I I find I always do better if I net deck to get an idea mm -hmm. of what to do and then go back in and adjust based on my own playstyle. So like. If I see somebody's like, this is a really good deck, blah, 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 and everyone's like, oh, wow, and I'm like, I don't understand why <laughs> yeah. this is a good deck, I think it's fun to build that, especially because you can in an LCG. Mm -hmm. You're never like, well, I can't build that because I need to go round up these $100 chase cards. Um, you know, So you just, <laughs> oh, I have the card, let me build it. And then you build it and you play with it and you go, oh, I see why they included this. I see what the, what the, what the game plan was, but then you go, but I also really, really like this card, so I'm just going to put that in because I'm happy every time I draw it. Yeah. You know, and stuff like that. And I find that that, that kind of, for me, it lets me sleep at night because, I mean, it's not a net deck. I, uh, you <laughs> uh, know, I, I started with, of course, you know, some other people's thoughts, but really I added this one single card, so this is now mine. <laughs> I've always been a proponent that 
there's people who can build decks well, and there's people who can play the game well, and sometimes there's people in the middle. Mm -hmm. And I can be one that either plays the game well or deck builds well, but like doing both is a very, very yeah. hard thing. So I've accepted the fact that some games I'm going to have to net deck, yeah. and some games I'm just going to get it. And I'm not going to yeah. be able to play it that well because there's a lot of decisions made, mm -hmm. that are made that I just can't comprehend. Mm -hmm. But the deck building is something I can get. And now, you feel free to disagree or agree with that in the comments. We'll yeah. talk about that later. But we're going to dive into the Imperial Psych World View. So um, we have a bunch of cards that uh, and themes and things like that that Jake and I have come up or I'm sorry, Jake has come up with and I just <laughs> kind of piggybacked on. Um, talking about the different things we saw in the, uh, the Imperial Cycle, what was interesting, what's powerful, what's not powerful, and some kind of like future states that we see being really fun in this game just based on cards that were created inside of this cycle. So Yeah, it's uh, they did some really interesting things. When you have um, you know, a game like this, you have uh, similar to uh, Conquest or Game of Thrones, mm -hmm. uh, really pretty much all the Fantasy Flight properties, you have like these factions, and they're the, the seven great clans of Rokugan in uh, L5R, and uh, each one has their own theme and everything. So what they did with this, uh, this pack cycle is they had these card cycles. So they had like, you know, every clan has a magistrate, mm -hmm. and that kind of has a certain expectation of when you've seen one you kind of know what the others are going to do and I really like that because it, it allows the kind of it expands the theme of the contrast between you know like Lion Clan is very aggressive whereas Crab Clan is very defensive and so when you have the same kind of card viewed for that lens um, you can kind of see that and so I kind of we looked at those and looked at the cycle in terms of like those and then we also looked at the main themes which are that this is about it's the imperial cycle mm -hmm. so it's about the imperial court the chrysanthemum throne the emperor and the families that are outside the clans that serve the emperor it's about the imperial city and its districts um and then in game terms who has the imperial favor what they can do once they have the imperial favor rather than just get that that plus one bonus uh, as well as um some other themes like just kind of expanding the amount of provinces and the mm -hmm. cool thing like you said about things where we're going to look at what they go into in the future is that they kind of I think left little breadcrumbs for us uh, people like me that like to hop on wikis and <laughs> uh, to speculate about what kind of cards we might see in the future because they added you know certain new card types we hadn't seen uh, or new card traits we hadn't seen in, in the base game and things like that that I think uh I think it was very well executed from yeah. that perspective. And this was all stuff that if you've been following LCGs for a while, you know happens. They mm -hmm. always have card cycles. They always mm -hmm. leave those breadcrumbs for mm -hmm. things in the future. But uh, we're really excited to talk about the ones from L5R today. So the first um, kind of idea of what's happening here with uh, what we're showing on the screen right now is Tears of Aramatsu or Amaretsu. Uh, we picked a few neutral provinces that we kind of think are, are interesting. Um, you want to talk about tiers real quick, Jake? Yeah, it's, it seemed like every uh, pack had at least one neutral uh, province in it, and, and those are cool because they kind of expanded the theme of you can only include this in your deck if you are a keeper, if you're a seeker, if you have the same right elemental role. So that was kind of a heavy um, thing that was added was basically what, uh, what your role is and how that affects your deck building. And that's really interesting when it comes to provinces, especially because... Um, you have five provinces, and you kind of you have to guess what the opponent is going to be running to kind of determine when you're. Well, you have to ahead. guess four of them because you, you have, have four. four when you, <laughs> yeah, well, it's always shameful to play, and that's kind of I think the downside of the tiers of Amaterasu is uh, it's a void province, but it's not shameful to play. So I really yeah. like it, and I think it's very interesting. I think it serves a very interesting part in the meta. Um, because it allows you to kind of protect yourself against a swarm attacking you, because if they attack with a swarm, you could get quite a big payoff. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But I don't know if we'll see a ton of play, just because Shameful Display is... I wonder if the shrine thing good. is going to be big. Like, is it going to be shrine? Okay. Because we, right, we saw, you know, spoiler alert for later in the video, but we saw monks come out, we mm -hmm. saw shrine maidens come out, mm -hmm. we saw... Um, you know things like that, so I definitely think something that count shrines could could, could, could come and, and could be part of kind of like a cool deck archetype. Mm -hmm. The one that I kind of thought was cool, and I don't think feast or famine, which is the next card, was in the last pack, but it's towards it's not in the first few. Yeah, it's towards the end. Yeah, uh, and it introduces this thing that we saw towards the end of the cycle, which was a specific uh, keeper seeker like an element only. Yeah, so like you, you can be, be a fire. keeper or a seeker, but you have to be a keeper seeker of fire, mm -hmm. and so that kind of 
the theme like leaving us off of the imperial cycle like towards the end of the imperial cycle is like now where are they gonna go like yeah like things care about what type of element you're keeping or seeking now like, yeah that's kind of an interesting thing and and i actually really like what visa famine is doing because we're talking about earlier like before the video again we're talking we should probably save stuff for all the video but there's a dragon card uh stone of sorrow right mm -hmm. that pulls fate off of or like it's a fate control card, right? Yeah, it's a st stone of is is uh, if the character that has the attachment is unbowed, um, your your opponents can't take fate from yeah. the rings. So the the fate just goes to the rings and just stays there. Um, and so this card is kind of cool because it plays with the whole like fate on car characters card. And I think so. You like mm -hmm. you you break it, it breaks, and then you basically get to like flip. So a po these power swings or these like fate swings are really important if you have three fate on a champion and your mm -hmm. champion's about to die if they, they, if they, they hit Feast or Famine then they're going to have to flip it and then they next they won't target that because they know it can happen so yeah, absolutely. it introduces a lot of interesting decision points where it may, if this is the like last problem you have to, to break over Shameful Display you're like wow which one do I yeah, really go for one of those is good. I don't want to have to choose that <laughs> Yeah, I, when I first saw it I thought that the card name was very apt because I thought it was basically going to be Feast or Famine when, when you run this you know yeah. the right the right deck runs into it and they're just like oh well i don't have fate on my character so and I it's don't care it's, but i've seen a lot of people saying that they really like this and i think a lot of that has to do with like lion lion decks being very strong right now mm -hmm. lots of people having characters that just keep fate they have ways to re-put fate on them mm -hmm. and then what basically happens is they hit this and that kind of uh, puts a damper on that so and, and you can put this in crap too and with the manipulation of holdings you mm. can actually make it stronger and really mm -hmm. save it so holding manipulation is on provinces is one of those things too that could really make this card really good or any of the any of these kind of provinces that are like when it's broken do x good yeah. or bad because you could control when it's broken more mm -hmm. if you can control the strength of the province and things like that so yeah and i, and I just like the fire um roll and things like yeah. that and it it, you know, once again, it allows you because we talk about the fact that you're looking at the clans through the different lenses, mm -hmm. but it's not actually just that. You know, you have these different elements, and they have their kind of own philosophical um, meaning yeah. and <laughs> what is fire versus water, and being able to kind of show that through cards like this, I think, is is a really strong um, element of how this game feels unique. Yeah, is uh, you know, you're not going to just instinctively be like, oh, this is like this faction or this. Type yeah, you don't game, think like, oh, this card's meant game. for crap, or this card's meant yeah. for blah. It's like really depends on what yeah. the roll they're running, and it, I, like you're right, the fire roll only thing, it doesn't, it means so much more than just like you get something when you reveal fire province, or mm -hmm. you get something mm -hmm. when you fire combat. Because yeah, like, which stuff you include in your deck can be affected by mm -hmm. if, if you're running secret keeper fire, especially when it comes to provinces. So is this yeah. one of the two you? Is this like you? You could have this in addition to another fire right yeah or if something you're like a uh if you're a seeker of fire because mm -hmm. keepers get the extra deck building influence for out of faction cards mm -hmm. and seekers get to double up on their element province yeah uh, and then if you're the type of player that likes kind of casual more kind of wacky anything goes there's nothing to stop you in kind of kitchen table games or casual games to just run whichever cards you want and mm -hmm. then you can have all of the elemental uh, province. Yeah, right. <laughs> so uh, that's another thing we could talk about for days. Yeah. Is like the whole idea of what if you're playing like the seeker roles and what if you're just kitchen yeah. tabling. But uh, the next, the I next, haven't done that, actually, so I don't know happened. how it works, but it sounds like it could be very fun. <laughs> uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is um, the idea of this imperial keyword and the districts that are mm, unfolding. Yeah. So the first uh, section that we're going to talk about is Jake really liked the crab stuff, or I made him choose, so he chose the crab stuff. Uh, as far as what what he liked about the the districts that have been introduced in the game, so the districts are all they all have the imperial um, trait. They're all meant to be parts of the imperial city, I believe, and yeah. all the different factions have those districts in the city. So um, they're all limit one per deck too, which is something to know for deck building purposes. So you only can have one of those holdings per deck, uh, which is interesting because most things are three of. So when yeah. you, you limit one per deck, that's a very interesting deck building restriction in a forty card deck game. Yeah, well, it's a. Uh it's, I mean, it's a specific district, so it's unique. You can only have one. I like that flavor, um, especially because as they introduce more cards like this, you could theoretically have, like, a bunch of one-of districts, and it could feel very, like, you know, oh, there's all these different places, but there's only, you know, one of each, and it's it's that could be interesting. I also like the uh, fact that in Crab, if you're going to release powerful, unique districts, Crab's going to have the synergy to... 
you know manipulate them or, or to trigger off them mm -hmm. so like for a lot of clans i think like let's put a one of district in this might feel like well if i don't draw it you know or you know well and it but also makes it, like, like it's you unique. always want to see districts yeah so. it's unique so like it would be a there'd be a, like a um a state-based rules problem if they didn't make it one per deck because you'd flip it up and you flip up another one and yeah you're like, crap what now i, I have to make a decision and yeah, so discard that makes one. sense from there but this hold or this district is really cool actually so um i don't know I feel like Dragon has a lot of attachment and manipulation right now, or has the premier attachment manipulation yeah, cards the attachment right now. Clan. Um, there's a few other ones like Scorpion has their their um, you know their card that can like you can dishonor someone and yeah. put an attachment on. But this is nice because it's an action you can do every turn. If you have extra fate left over, you can either get the attachment yourself mm -hmm. or you can just discard an attachment. So that's pretty cool when you're controlling your opponent's board state. And yeah, I as, like it as somebody that plays a lot of Dragon. Um, and depends on my attachments uh, a lot of the time to kind of execute my game plan. I've never had an opponent say, "Oh, I'm going to go ahead and steal this attachment from you." And I've been like, "That's fine. You know, <laughs> yeah, I can I I'm can okay live with, with that." that. <laughs> it's always like, you know, uh, all right, be polite. Don't say something horrible to this. <laughs> you know, because it's it, it it really feels bad. And so the ability to do that over and over potentially um, is strong. And so you say, okay, but they need you know a good economy, um, but crab is shaping up to be also well, the can, economy factor. You can play like Levy, like yeah, then they have to make these decisions that are yeah. like, oh, crap, well, I know they have uh, this district out, and I know that if I... I have to make these... Like, yeah, ugh, it, yeah. Adds, it adds a lot to the... Um, In these games, game these state. complex, adding more decision points is always going to make your opponent's life harder. Because like, there's always so much you have to consider every game. Yeah. And making them make another decision, while most of the time people dislike the ability to, or dislike the cards that cause your opponent to choose something mm -hmm. this is a game where if even one thing is considered wrong making that choice can can be very very detrimental if you make yeah, it wrong it's, uh, it's one of those uh, games where you can lose and then be like oh, I don't know why I lost and then when you like really think about it you're like it was that moment that and, single uh, moment <laughs> you know it was when I didn't when I lost my katana and you know so that's uh, adding things like this definitely I think it adds uh the the depth i think a lot of times when i read these cards i'm like okay it's pretty straightforward but then um <laughs> as i think it's a sign of a good well-built game system as i think about then the implications of the fairly simple cards uh it, it adds a ton like this of next depth. one iron mine very mm. straightforward card this is a card that is very cool <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. I, i'm a fan of iron mine because and i had a discussion about this on facebook with somebody but iron mine is a card that's a card that's been in um L5R for a long time, mm -hmm. and it's also been in the Game of Thrones card game for a long time. Did we, did we determine who was first? Did um, we ever figure that Iron out? Iron Mine was first printed in game in uh, in L5R, oh, but okay. it didn't do this. Okay. And so this effect of being able to oh, save okay. or you know, yeah. keep your character from dying is something that was introduced on an Iron Mine in the Game of Thrones card game, but this is a good appropriation yeah, of that effect, yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very good. I like the, the marriage of the two <laughs> yeah. traditions, the, the FFG games now but yeah i'm a fan I, I like the thing the thing that you always have to remember though about these cards is that uh you cannot stop something from sacrificing if it's cost so if you're sitting there and you're like cool these this card can save me it basically saves the character sacrifice for all the, the crab costs it doesn't stop you from yeah you it can, doesn't stop that from sacrificing. yeah you can't do it if it's a cost because if you do anything that prevents you from act, actually paying the cost you didn't pay the then cost. you were not considered to pay the cost mm -hmm. and so the thing doesn't happen but so you just lost your iron mind that, but that's you it. can <laughs> use it in some things the sacrifice is actually part of the effect yes uh which uh you know you have to pay careful attention to the way the card is worded but then in case like that this can be absolutely amazing mm -hmm. Because um, it allows you to do that, but anytime you're preventing a character from going away, you're basically it's a huge force multiplier in a game like this. Because when you pay, in, in most games, you pay for a four cost character, and it's it's expected to roughly be a four cost character for the rest of time, mm -hmm. right? It's you know it, it's not really variable. It's going to get killed later or sent you know sent away or something, but with this game everything you buy because of the, the concept of uh, mono mono no awade is basically it's gonna go away um it's impermanent it's you know like the beautiful cherry blossom that's gonna fade one day and fall <laughs> so when you throw a wrench in that and you go hey i bought this five cost dude and i know you thought you only had to deal with him this turn but uh, now no, he's actually gonna yeah. stick around 
that is a huge swing as as a lot of lion effects do that now crab is becoming uh equally strong in that it's uh, I mean, even if you see a unique character that flips up in the dynasty phase you're like crap like yeah. now i gotta deal with that champion for another turn or now i gotta yeah. deal with so-and-so for another turn so it, it really affects your plans and again it's another one of those decision points that you are like okay I thought I knew what I was going to do this yeah. and now there's an extra fate on that guy, and yeah. now I have to make the decision. Yeah, I planned for him to be gone, <laughs> but he's still here, and he's still attacking my province. And so the Imperial District that I personally liked the most was the uh, Kanja District. Um, I thought it was interesting just because uh, it's one of the new effects that discards Imperial Favor to do something. Yeah. And um, <laughs> I got hit with a fate worse than death the other day when I was playing in game um, and I was like what just happened like yeah and this effect is about half of fate worse than death like, yeah so I'm okay with that um and I'm okay with discarding imperial favor in phoenix since they have their stronghold and they can very reliably get imperial favor back oh, yeah, every turn the glory values um, they can, yeah it, and adding plus two I think the other one added plus two too I'm not really sure uh, plus one but plus two to a province is pretty nice mm -hmm. or, uh on a holding Especially, Especially Phoenix yeah. tends to play defensively, mm -hmm. so they'll take it. So I'm a fan of this card uh, mostly just because uh, I think it, it fits right into what Phoenix already wants to do really yeah. well. And yeah. I bowing and moving a character home is it's just so good. Like it's so it's so yeah. it's so great. Such a great effect. Mm -hmm. um, especially when the games that I've been playing, I honestly haven't had an Imperial Favor do a ton in just adding one. Like, I haven't ever had it, like, win or lose me a game because of it. It's mostly yeah. because of my bad plays is why I lose the game. But this if this additional things you can do with Imperial Favor makes me really happy, especially when you have a good board state. Yeah, like, you can, I, I, think it's, I think it's important to emphasize the Imperial Favor. Because like you said, like, you, you know, it's never won or lost me the game. But if I think about, you know, as I was talking about earlier, sometimes you lose or you win and you kind of need to trace back mm -hmm. and try to, if you want to get better at the game, figure out, you know, why that was the case. Yeah. And... With the Imperial Favor, if I think back in a lot of the games where I just struggled to ever claim it, maybe that plus one didn't ever win the game, but the fact that they were consistently claiming it, yeah. I almost always lost those games where I couldn't <laughs> hold it. And so adding kind of more reasons why it's important, I think, is, is good for transparency and clarity. Like, if you can keep the Imperial Favor um, consistently, it gives you're it probably more, playing well. It gives it more, like, life. Uh, yeah. Having effects that you can use Imperial Favor for makes it so I I care about more than just a plus one or a minus one as a player who's still not into the upper echelon of like what would be considered a good player. Like I can now know that there's a like even from a perspective of if I'm not playing these cards, I can know that I shouldn't let my opponent have it because they might use an effect like this exactly. that care yeah. that matters. So um, that was really cool. I thought this was a really interesting card. Uh, my my other favorite one here was Magnificent Lighthouse. Um, <laughs> I, I'm a fan of any card that lets you like just mess with your opponent. Like yeah. they're messing with an opponent's deck is just a really powerful thing, especially when you get to choose three and yeah. See what so they when do. I saw this, I was like, okay, so Phoenix often is playing a dishonor strategy, where they essentially bully the opponent into bidding one, and then this would essentially let you not only ha force them to bid one, but then you get to dictate what that what one that card one is. is. <laughs> and when you get in a situation like that, and you feel that like kind of lock come down. It can be really, really hard. Now, a lot of the Phoenix players that I've talked to told me personally that they don't envision themselves running this mm -hmm. because they would rather run uh, the library. Uh, no, the draw library. The yeah. draw library. And I think that's an interesting thing because now we see basically cards informing people's play style where they go, well, yes, I'm a Phoenix player. But I'm not one of those, you know, lock it down. Just <laughs> one of those control I, Phoenix I, yeah, players. Yeah, I want to. I want to put Shugenjos out and take, you know, break provinces. <laughs> That's, interesting. With spells. That's interesting. And so it's like, okay, so this is kind of like a, you know, if you if you see it in an opponent's deck or you see it in a net deck, as we discussed earlier, you know, you're you're looking at the net decks, um, you can kind of like, oh, this is meant to be played more like this, mm -hmm. and that's always awesome to see that to kind of be able to read. That. And same thing when you're playing, you know, you see them flip a flip a province or flip a you know thing onto their their province from their dynasty deck, and then it's a holding, and you're like, oh, it's lighthouse. And you're like, all right, I know what to expect. I, I better know, change my yeah, I better <laughs> I better stop assuming that they're just going to be swinging in with with big, you know, honored characters and think that maybe they're going to be pushing that a different way. I also like that it's got plus two again of like yep. let's let Phoenix defend better yep. and Landmark is a cool trait I wonder if it's going to yeah. be anything someday I, I, is, is this the only one that has Landmark? That is a big question I think <laughs> I it know. is but if, if nothing tells you to look for the traits I find that sometimes I forget to look for the traits yeah. 
and they're in different locations and all the cards are different so if you if you're like not paying attention to them that's why i'm bringing them up because yeah sometimes traits are the most important thing in a game yep so for your landmark deck <laughs> for your landmark deck uh so the the next thing we're going to talk about is uh seeker only cards so uh we went through and kind of picked our favorite seeker only cards mm -hmm. now <laughs> two of the cards we're going to we're going to show in the seeker and keeper only stuff that we're going to do next is going to be they're both two of them are unicorn they might do the same thing but we're going to talk about why they're not the same card so uh mm -hmm. but the first thing we're going to talk about today is pathfinder's blade and jake you want to talk about pathfinder's blade uh, i picked pathfinder's blade um as a dragon player as my favorite uh dragon card of this cycle because crab actually uh, can't play it right now um and it which is another interesting aspect I've, I've seen a lot of people who are kind of casually following l5r and maybe you know maybe they're a diehard net runner and they're just kind of cautiously and they say oh well that i really you know they print a crab card and i can't play it as a crab player and it's like yeah but other people can play it mm -hmm. so it's like the the potential for impact on what kind of decks you see is i think a lot more greater than if you just look at it face value and go crab got this because yeah. really like i said i view this as basically currently it's a dragon card because well, like look at this as a dragon card yeah it's giving it's a zero cost <laughs> attachment yep that's pretty Always. much what I'll, you want yeah you put three it gives you plus one military that's that could be consequential in some ways i don't know yeah it's a weapon so there's a cards that search weapons i think mm -hmm. there's the smith there's a gosh of swords one yeah. influence one influence, yeah. One you influence. can put three of them and not even really feel it. <laughs> Cancel the effect for one for one influence and zero cost. Yeah, that's so great. So initially, when I saw it, I was like, "That seems really good," but I feel like I feel like I'm just it's a psychology thing, right? Because when you run into somebody's province and they flip it and it's that one, you're like you, you're saying to yourself, "All right, as long as it's not province, you know, X, this is going to go well." And then they flip it, and it's always that one, right? That you said, "As long as it's not that, I'll do fine." Uh, so Pathfinder's Blade lets you basically be like. Nope, you know, and so it gives you that very. And I'm well, like, all right, but maybe it's not that good. Yeah, because I mean, because it's just it feels like it's good because it makes you know. This but I is think it is good, good for lion. This is still good for mm -hmm. unicorn. I would, I hate running into the like meditations, of, not meditations of the Tau, but um, I mean that can that can whatever uh, one that flips the conflict type when you're military oriented deck and like unicorn really sucks well, <laughs> the, there's the phoenix there's uh, Kuroi Mori but that one is an is, action isn't it or is it a reaction. Oh, no, it is a reaction. You're right. Is it? I think so. So that's something you have to pay attention to, is mm -hmm. not all of the provinces are actions, not all of them. You know, your shameful displays. You can't like cancel, that. like, a... Yeah, like a which, it would probably be too powerful this. if yeah. you could just <laughs> delete the, the text on a province whenever you, you mm -hmm. went into it. But it's very good. Like I said in Dragon, you know, it's only a plus one military, but you have your stronghold to pump further. You need the one-cost attachments. Yeah. Um, you know, and it seems like more effects are coming out, too, that kind of do the you you know you move to a different province than you thought with mm -hmm. some of the other things we're speaking talk of about, which you know uh the next so card is chasing the sun that was a good that was a good segue yeah. uh so this card is the one i chose and I, i'm i've been in this situation since the beginning of the game where um my my roommate plays as well uh he aaron shepherd he's in the uh, run of videos if you ever watch our channel um he wanted he liked unicorn in the original l5r and he was a diehard unicorn fan he loved the effect of being able to commit cavalry after you yeah committed other people that was great but it felt like the changes to Unicorn in the new game have made them, like, boring. And and the, the other thing on top of that is that they're not really a good di they're not really a good faction right now because of the things that are in the game. I think I think the end of this cycle put them in a much better place. Yes. Uh -huh. And I think that not maybe not this card or one of the or the talisman card. One of those two cards is what can make them better. I think these two cards that we're gonna talk about. I think, I think they both good. could make them better. Yes, yeah. Uh, it just depends on obviously which one they have access mm -hmm. to based on the uh, you know the wise decisions of the uh, Hanamoto's uh, <laughs> Imperial Court, but uh, also what kind of deck Unicorn wants to be. And I think there's been a lot of debate of that. People see Unicorn, they see the angry guys riding people down on horses, and they go, "Okay, I know what this is. This is aggro. Go in ten ten dudes, all of them attack. The game only lasts you know two and a half turns." Um, and then, but then there's this other strategy. But, but it, that didn't really work. But where they seem to be really good is <laughs> even more kind of like a tricksy, like you know, I've got lots of people to move your people home and to move mine in and out, and like you think yep. we're here and we're over there, and it's almost like 
they're they're such good ninjas that they don't even actually have the shinobi trait um <laughs> because they're they're that good at you know kind of shadow shadow boxing that they you, you don't even know that no they use like doing. the gaijin word cavalry instead yeah. of having like a japanese word for like them being ninjas well and yeah <laughs> th this is the attacking version so seekers again i think you mentioned Se earlier seekers, seekers are seekers always about offense. attacking yeah. they care about attacking and keepers generally care about defending yep but this card i think is a great trick that unicorn might have needed that wasn't a uh what is it? A telegraph trick. It's something yeah. that said it's in your hand, and uh, you know that you can use a stronghold move cavalry. You know that there's cards that have printed cavalry, like or printed move on them. Mm -hmm. There's the saddle. There's mm -hmm. things like that, right? But this card is a trick that lets you over or under commit to a certain province, and then change what you're doing based off of what your opponent does. Yeah, you you know you send two two people into attack. They say, "Oh, it's only two. They're they're going up. It has oh, a man. holding on it. They got to break <laughs> seven, or maybe you hit one of the uh, the water provinces. It says, oh, in a military or not the earth. Sorry, the earth, where it says like in a military conflict, this gets plus ten, and they they go, ha ha ha. They'll never they'll never break my whatever. Mm -hmm. And so they only send like you know one person out just so they don't lose the yep. honor." For, for an undefended and this and is then they're, like, they're like okay even if they can move these people I'll still be good here because yeah. it's 10 and then you switch it and then move all your guys to yeah. it and break it then you break through and then you break another one yeah. and they're like what just happened like what happened I think here it's, I think it's always a, a risk too though with um, non-zero cost events that you don't go nuts in your deck because sometimes you just need <laughs> yeah. things that will win well, especially with any unicorn. conflict not yeah, just like true. in the right scenario this will do this you need like bonsai you need court games mm -hmm. and so um the, the the fear i would have playing this if i was playing unicorn would be like it's putting this in my hand and just like looking at it every turn and being like oh yeah just wait. i already do that with just all my wait. unicorn cards anyway because i don't i do that with so all my like... cards just because i'm i'm very uh non-committal <laughs> a lot of the time but uh, the one thing i do i do think you brought up there that was important was that it costs one so yeah. in if unicorn zero. you really need to manage your money or you're gonna lose and it, you'll probably lose anyway but you'll need to manage your money <laughs> if you want to get closer I, to not losing. i don't think it's that dire and i think it'd be I better they got those it, sweet sweet yurts yurts full of that's full i haven't played that yet <laughs> money uh okay so let's go on to the uh keeper cards so the keeper card that i thought was really cool was backhand the compliment um i i I like the idea that this card works both ways. So, like, I can draw a card if I need mm -hmm. to, or and I don't care because I'm a scorpion and being mm -hmm. dishonored is something that I live with. Or, or like you mentioned so uh, elegantly earlier, yeah, you can push your opponent into dishonor with this card, and it costs you nothing. Yeah, I besides them drawing, coming it literally costs you nothing. But it, the card draw is something they get. But if they're losing the game, then the card draw yeah. doesn't matter. I've had a lot of games where I've gotten somebody down to like one, one honor, two honor. And you're just like ha ha ha, but then they just they can they can play the rest of the game at one or two honor because there's not effects that you can really execute. It depends on them bidding poorly or them getting their characters dishonored and then not having a way to honor them before they leave play, or you know, if they know the air ring will lose them the game, the air ring effect, then like you better believe they're going to pull the know, air ring. Pull the air ring or just commit everything they have to defending it. Um, whereas something like this, because it's coming, it's hidden information, it's coming from your hand, they can be like, all right, the air ring's off the table, I successfully defend it, I've got my one, you know, honor, everything's good, and then you just basically can execute that dishonor strategy, yeah. um, which I think is good. Um, also, I think the flavor of this uh, card is just phenomenal. <laughs> um, because it's what, like, what other game are you gonna literally have a backhanded compliment be... And there's literally a backhanded compliment on the card. Yeah, the flavor text is a backhanded <laughs> compliment. Like, I, there's very few games where that kind of thing would make a good card. Yeah. Um, and I think that's that's something I really like about L5R mm -hmm. is, like, in most other games, this would just be, like, explosive something. Or, you know, you're like, okay, cool. But, like, just the <laughs> fact that, like, you can win this game just by showing up and low-key dissing your opponent's kimonos yeah. is, is, I think, a pretty... Oh, that's a great kimono. Yeah. Oh, for somebody with your amount of money, that's a very nice <laughs> fashion. You know, like, come on. Like, it's great that you can win by snarky comments and mm -hmm. starting rumors about people. Uh, the next the other card that we picked here that I forced Jake to pick <laughs> was the Talisman of the Sun. Um, it's a nice little uh, attachment on its own if we just look at the uh, the left side of the card. It's yeah, pretty good. Yeah, just like oh, what long, you long, get long. for what you pay. Mm -hmm. It's fair. Keep a roll. It's an item. And this is, you were talking about the Mishido thing? Yeah, Mishido. Mishido. Like, um, it's one of those traits, once again, where I don't know that there's anything that really 
um, triggers on it. I don't know that anyone is really looking for my Shoto cards, mm -hmm. but it's it's a, such a core part of Unicorn's identity, lore wise, um, and the conflict with the Phoenix and the different schools of magic, and you know, is this blasphemous to like imprison spirits and artifacts? Um, well, I just learned what Machado was then. Yeah, so so the <laughs> Phoenix, they, like, ask the spirits to, like, you know, hey, please uh, give my guy plus five military skill. <laughs> um, you know, oh, great commie, you know. And Machado is, it's, I think, you know, the unicorn learned it when they were wandering outside of Rogagon, and it's basically, like, kind of think more, like, dark magic, where they're like, I'm taking that spirit, and I'm forcing them to live in this, this staff, and now I can do magic with it. So this is like the equivalent of like the Rokugan Ghostbusters trap. Yeah, okay. yeah. It's um, and so I think that's really cool that we're seeing that in, and I hope that at some point there's like a, a deck where you can, um, you know, stop magic from well, scrapping like, spirits or something. Well, like, like maybe like benefit, like you mm -hmm. get a bonus for each Machado, or conversely, maybe like a Phoenix card that like punishes Machado, yeah. Machado or something. You know, like it's it's just the fact that it's there shows me that they you know are thinking several steps mm -hmm. ahead in terms of what's going to be in this game um, and putting it there and I just wanted I wanted to see a Mishoto item or a Mishoto something or spell or something just to like you know get where that goes but um, now the effect on this card is very similar to Chasing the Sun um, yeah it's cool it shows but the it's Keeper defending Seeker. and so like this is one of those things we talked about earlier if you can control what provinces are getting hit and aren't getting hit yeah. you can actually do a lot with the game um, this one doesn't let you like kind of go through the breakthrough aggro combo what that chasing the sun could do, but no. it does make it so you get a lot of defensive control. Yeah, well, so like what happens a lot of times is you flip up like a shameful display, and then the opponent goes, "Well, I'm not going in that province anymore because I don't want to. I'm sick but of getting this one." And then in this, it's, it reminds me of if anyone also has played Netrunner, it's a very uh, like Jinteki. Yep. Like, oh, you think you're running on this, but actually you're running really? on this thing filled with horrible traps. And I like that you could sideboard it into Phoenix if you wanted to. Yeah. And that's funny to me from the lore. From the lore. You're like, well, we don't usually trap Kami, but, you know, this well, guy is pissing me off. Listen, <laughs> we're never going to stop this horrible magic unless we get some hands-on experience with it. You know, we don't want to make you repeatedly run into our... Uh, <laughs> you know our, our horrible province but you know we gotta learn about this stuff somehow so uh the next type of cards we're going to talk about are just big beefy five cost goodness so yeah they're like the the new champions yeah kind yeah, of, yeah. The new they're champions. not they don't all have the champion tag but that's I don't think, how do I, any of them oh no no well so. uh agasha Sumiko does because she's the ruby champion in lore um but these to me are like the replacement champions like if you you know want to run somebody who's not or if you just are okay with being greedy and having a bunch of five cost characters in your your deck <laughs> the, the first one we got is the lion ikomo ujaki is that yeah that uh, ikomo ujaki ujaki okay. i don't think i a diphthongs in japanese which this is don't worry i can't speak english well enough so yeah. i just kind of like throw words together and hope they make the right sound uh but this is another one that discards imperial favor that's kind of cool yeah that's a, it's a theme um five that, five political and line is good well, so his ability is just nuts. This is one of those cards where I'm just like, oh my god, they printed this? Yeah. Um, and, and I guess, and even more, they printed this in Lion. Because if you print this in any clan, it would be phenomenal. Mm -hmm. But you print it in Lion, which is like primed to abuse this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, just nuts. Yeah, and like you, you just, you just hit, all you got to do is build a deck with like low holdings or maybe even no holdings, and you just hit like... Mm -hmm. Good, good stuff every time. I mean, imagine if if you focused a deck on just doing like big beaters, right? And all you uh -huh. did was put a bunch of really high cost stuff in your dynasty deck, and you get this guy out, and you just focus on keeping him around. Mm -hmm. And you just, every turn you get in favor, and you just keep doing this every turn. You don't pay any money to do anything else, and you yeah. just like keep this dude out. Yeah, that's the darkest. <laughs> that timeline that would be it. That players. is, they all have mustaches in that timeline. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, and he, he does have a mustache. He does, you're right. That's why he's the dark one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, his, his hair, I like the, the salt and pepper. It's great. He's a he's just on a horse. So the Okoma are uh, basically like the historians. Okay. Um, they're the more political side of the lion. They're like the strategists, and they do a lot with like ancestors, the calling the spirits of the ancestors to like guide their, their warriors. Um, and so thematically, it's also a really good card. Um, I, I wish something... I think this. I wish this was like in any other clan to like 
give them a boost. But by the way, keywords on or traits on this guy? Yeah, it's just which t- if you could pick two traits to be on a character. for your character to have, what would they be? And it's Bushi and, and Courier, Courier. <laughs> and he has both. So great card, absolutely wonderful card. Um, I don't know if I've had to play against it mm-hmm. recently. But I've seen games of other people's, and it just, I mean, it's a huge swing. So. <laughs> and the one that I like the most, because, again, I've been having a lot of luck with Scorpion, is, uh, oh, my gosh, the Bayushi. Is that, is that? Bayushi? 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 Yeah, Bayushi. Kachiko. Kachiko. Okay, there we go. I, I didn't say it, but Jake did. So somebody here said it. Uh, again, five cost, three, six, mil, six uh, political. That's a lot of uh, glory for a Scorpion for, character. Which in Scorpion is not always great. Um, because in Scorpion, you kind of go, you know, your role in life is to do dishonorable things, <laughs> and sometimes a high glory is is bad. But um, you know, you should be crafty enough to turn yeah. it in your favor. Um, I, this is a conflict card, by the way. This is a five cost yeah. conflict card. That's the only other. There's like very few. There's there's no other five cost character conflict characters. I don't think. No, I'm but there are so. a few other five cost like. Events, yeah. Um, I, one we're going to talk about later. Yeah, I uh, think I think if you're paying five for something in a conflict round, it's it needs gonna, to be yeah. like we could just call it like the Kachiko like standard, right? Like it needs to be that <laughs> That's a good, good, right? Yeah. Because um, if you and but, so here's the thing, Scorpion does this a lot, where you know they don't spend much money in the dynasty phase, and mm-hmm. they're kind of telegraphing, hey. A bunch of horrible things, horrible, dishonorable <laughs> things are about to happen to you. And just um, wait, there's more. Uh, so Kachiko fits in that perfectly. Uh, also, very uh, lore important character. Um, she's in a lot of the fiction for the packs, um, and pivotal character in the old story. Hmm. Um, so we'll see. We'll see what happens. But uh, but yeah. its ability though, like that's great. Um, this is uh, what is it? It's um. It's not core games on a stick, but it's um, it's the other one. Are you talking about so because it sends because it sends something home with a lower political. and then you may or may not that part that, we're going to talk about in a second. But it's, the, no, it's not core games. It's um, uh, out outwit outwit. So this is outwit. It's on better a stick. than outwit though because outwit. I don't think you can ever choose to bow them. No, that's what I mean. So the first yeah. sentence of this it is is outwit. is outwit, and I think it's better. Well, it doesn't matter because the core tier thing doesn't matter, but. Then you may bow it is an interesting thing because it yeah. doesn't say bow it. It no. says then you can bow it. No, so normally when you when you send somebody home in a political conflict, military conflict, whatever, when you like play an outwit or a route or you know any of the other cards that do that, they're unbound. So then you're just like, all right, fine. Like so, if it's like let's say your opponent is a dragon, they have very very even stat values. They have good military and political. You send somebody on home bound, and they're like, cool. I'm going to use this in my next conflict, mm-hmm. or I'm going to defend with it. Um, but with uh, Kachiko, you can basically say, no, you're not. Yeah, now, you're good. But let's say you do the opposite. Let's say you go, you know, you're borrowing some kind of gaijin uh, tactics from the unicorn, or, and you're like, I want to pull my guys out to use them later. Yeah. And you're like, no, I'm not going to This card doesn't say it has to be your opponent's character. No. So yeah. you can send one of, so you maybe overcommitted, or somebody pulled something in with a one of the card, one of the crane cards that can pull people in. Yeah. You can be like, well, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna win this, so I'm gonna use her action to pull back and not bow. It's whatever the opposite wanna... of a harpoon is. Yeah, like a like a like, like a, a fire un- extinguisher in an, an office harpoon. chair. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. really cool effects on this card, and the wording again, wording in this game is very important because yes. you need to pay attention to if it's your opponent's, if it's yours. Dip it his different synthesis. There's just so much if you're going to get into like the meta play that also, keeping them. Also, though, honestly, um, if somebody blanks the text box, if somebody clouds the mind, I think it's still playable. Oh, yeah. Stat wise. So, um, and traits wise. So. Imperial keyword, too, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. There's like one um, or two cards that care about that. There's, yeah, I'm really thinking that there's an Imperial deck kicking around that I, I, I have, I've theory crafted them, but I haven't tried them of where you have like, uh, I don't think we have the card to talk about, uh, but Seppin uh, Ish- Ishikawa. Um, the neutral guy? Yeah, yeah, which like gets plus one, one for each Imperial card you have in play. Mm-hmm. Um, there you so go. There's yeah. some way, there's already some synergy there. There's uh, Mia Satoshi doesn't work here because Mia Satoshi, I think, can only search for Dynasty cards. But the point is, Imperial, mm-hmm. I think there's an Imperial deck somewhere, and I, because I was theory crafting that deck, I had to run down to see who has all the <laughs> Imperial cards. The Scorpion currently has the most Imperial traded cards hmm. at their disposal. 
So there, there's a card in Game of Thrones called uh, it's it's an agenda. So an agenda in Game of Thrones is it affects how you build your deck. It's called the Brotherhood Without Banners, and what it lets you mm. do is it lets you build with the neutral cards really effectively and give okay. them buffs that they normally wouldn't have. I want to see that that yeah. role in this game where yeah. it's like uh, imperial something. And yeah. it, what it lets you do is it lets you pull in cards from multiple factions if they have the imperial keyword, and lets you do something else with neutral cards. Yeah, like, I want to I, I want to see stuff like that. I, I I missed I missed the boat. Um, they I guess never went on clearance at that store I used to go at and buy the cards, so I never played the old five R. Because it was actually um, a game they wouldn't clearance as fun, or they didn't have it. <laughs> I don't remember seeing them. It seems like something I would have bought, but um, so. In that, in the old version, there was all sorts of decks that mm -hmm. were like outside of the clans. There was like monk decks, where it was like just monk. It wasn't there like was dragon like the monks. Decks you could there play was Shadowlands. Too. There was like Rattlings and sweet. So I'm really hoping they find a way to bring that stuff in. Maybe and deluxe it, expansions. Hopefully, deluxe expansions. Yeah. Because they have the the clan packs now, which are going to cover what deluxe expansions used to do. See, I don't know that there it's a one for one well, replacement. Um, the clan packs. I think are going to do the faction specific stuff from the old versions of deluxe expansion. So like in, in Conquest yeah. you had like Tyranids were the main mm -hmm. focus, right? But then there was a bunch of other cards yeah. out of faction. But I, you're right, it's probably not going to be tit for tat. But I think I think that they from the other LCGs they learned that even after releasing deluxe expansions and smaller packs that we still had money in our wallets. And so they <laughs> came up with a genius new type of pack well, to extract even more of that well, I, that I will happily do. For give them. people getting into the game though, it could be nice. And oh, that'll be perfect. We always have that. to keep in mind and, and I know people hate this, but the core set designs this the, the design of the system for an L C G is something that facilitates players who don't play or don't look at yeah. playing three of copies of everything to get into a game the way they want to. And yeah. That's something we just have to keep in mind as competitive people that want to buy three of everything and think it's annoying to have to get this stuff. Well, three I, times, uh, so. if I had like a friend, like after the, after the the class or the, uh, clan packs start coming out, if I had like a friend that I knew really liked one theme, like let's say they played old five R, um, like a good gift, right? We're kind of in a gift giving season, so I'm still in that mode, um, but like giving. A corset and, and like clan one pack. clan yeah. pack would be like a great way. Well, the clan to pack like, is three of copies, so that's nice. it's three of copies, and um, like you know that a lot of the stuff in there is going to be useful. Mm -hmm. So they could definitely build a better deck out of that than just a corset. So I don't know. I think it'll be great. Um, yeah. I'm, it's well, it's money, like I said, that they're trying to get from us. But I'm happy to give it because yes. I think the value will still be incredible. All right, let's move on to the next uh, subset of cards. I guess it's, this is seals. So we got a seal for every faction. And yeah, we're talking like. Wax seal, not like the animal. Uh, There's not like a, fa a faction themed seal, like not, a, yeah. a bushy seal. Yeah, or like, like a you have your rat seal. folk and your goblins and your oni. <laughs> uh, all all the seals are zero cost, and all of them do give different stat bonuses. They uh, give they give a clan. They give different stat bonuses. Mm -hmm. They give the clan mon symbol. Um, so even if you put this on like you know Seppan Ishigawa, we were talking about, if you give them a seal of the unicorn, it's now not just an, a neutral imperial. It is literally a unicorn character, and mm -hmm. then it gives them a trait. Um, and when I first saw these, I was just like, oh man, guys, you really didn't know what to do to put in these packs, right? So you're just like pulling stuff. But I think, um, I think after seeing them all, I'm actually really glad they printed them because they open up a lot of design space in the future. Mm -hmm. Um, some more than others, which is, I think why we have the, the seal of the unicorn up yeah. specifically. Yeah. Uh, cause giving things cavalry right, right now is, I think necessary, probably the strongest. Yeah, okay. Seal. There's three things about these seals that are going to talk about. One is that it helps in faction cards get a symbol that it, get a keyword that they might need yeah. that they don't have. Mm -hmm. A second is it helps out of faction cards get a, a keyword that they don't have. Well, and get right. the clan mod. Yeah, right. well, yeah, yeah. Is so that the third? Yeah. That third, the third one is yeah, get the clan yeah, yeah. symbol. So, the, so giving. So it's still important to remember that you can have a, a unit, you can have a character in your deck that needs a bushi, or then not bushi. Sorry, that needs cavalry or scholar or monk mm -hmm. that doesn't have it. There's a lot of dragon cards that don't have monk that could really like tattoos. Yeah. And so it's really important to know that. Uh, these car, these keywords, these traits matter, and keeping in mind that they're important. And mm -hmm. uh, the thing I, I just noticed about all these that I think is cool to go through and look is I think their clan mantra or something like that is there. Yeah, they have like a like little flavor about like what it means to be a member of that clan. Mm -hmm. And this this is kind of like I think a pseudo historical thing, like back in the day, um, if like certain like people that weren't samurai or things like that proved themselves to certain uh, Japanese clans, they would like basically like make them like an honorary. Like you're a member of this clan, and, and you so have that, like proof of it. Yeah, and uh, and then in, in in Japanese culture, even to this day, they use these seals as like a 
you know, you sign off on something. Mm -hmm. So, like, you know, if you were going to the, the bank in Rokugan to take out some, some koku or whatever, you know, you would, like, put your, your family seal on the <laughs> paper to, like, to let whatever. them know. So okay. this is, like, their daimyo saying, like, you're a member of our clan now. Yeah. Uh, so super thematic. Super, super thematic. But and they all look different, too. If you look at, if you look at the <laughs> yeah. art, they, the style of each one reflects the style of, like, this one looks like it's carved out of, like, ivory or something, mm -hmm. which... Only the unicorn would have access to probably yeah. find. Um, so uh, we we kind of talked through that uh, this earlier without you guys here, but we'll talk about it again real quick. Cavalry seems to be the most important one. I think we're talking about um, monk being another good yeah, one. Uh, so the seal of dragon. I'd say like cavalry because you always have your clan stronghold, clan stronghold. for synergy. Mm -hmm. You currently with the cards that are in the pool, you cannot play unicorns without having something on the board that cares about cavalry. Mm -hmm. I'd say monk then next because you have the keyhose, you have monk And there's just a lot of monk traded cards right there's now. There's a lot of monk traded cards so in multiple factions. And then you have like almost all the other ones are not quite as good yeah. like duelist there's duelist I'm the most hopeful for the future the seal of the crane mm -hmm. that like I want duelist decks to be a thing. And we'll talk about that more That'd later cool. what they've done to expand dueling. Because I've played kind of with all of the duelist cards available now, just shove them all in a deck, and it, it's like I it's maybe okay. I'm like a sadist or a masochist or something, but having to go through that the dial phase for dueling and making yeah. an opponent do that—they're like, like timeout decks, the two, decks that play the time <laughs> three times uh, uh, a turn. Uh, I find really fun. Um, I like the mind game aspect of it. Um, so that's good, but like you know, there's only one thing right now that cares about the commander trait and the scholar trait. There's only one. Scholar is only one. The, thing. the one, the shinobi one. It, there's a few more cards that yeah, care about shinobi. Shinobi is probably maybe the third best. But one. shinobi's still one of those traits that's very light right now. There's yeah. a pretty. There's some pretty good shinobi cards. So yeah, the shinobi cards you're playing now, you're not playing for the trait of shinobi. You're playing it because they're really strong cards and, and they do what you want to do. Then there's two cards that do care about shinobi trait that you can then like give shinobi to other cards that might not have it so it goes back to that first thing we talked about but i think you're right shinobi's like three or four on the list because there's actually yeah. sh some but shinobi synergy they all open up design space yes and which, that's the most important part and, and and i wasn't sure that they did that super intentionally or if they kind of just like let's print these just in case we need them but i think having seen kind of like the the clan packs and what they're going to do in the future i think mm -hmm. it was very intentional yeah um, and that's good right so the next ones we're going to talk about are the magistrate cycle of cards every faction got one magistrate in this in the yeah. cycle uh, the the one that Jake liked the most was Cunning Magistrate. Uh, so you know, you can see what it is on there. It's Bushi, which is kind of interesting to me. A lot of the uh, Scorpion cards are not Bushis. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. and it's another Imperial one, which mm -hmm. is kind of nice. So uh, the whole set of these Magistrate cards are all about ignoring stuff. Like, yeah, they basically. they pick something that's important to them or their clan, and they basically say if you don't do that you don't count in conflicts. Mm -hmm. So it's like their Imperial representative basically saying, you know, hey, look at all these, insert whatever they don't like about the other clan people. We should make sure that they're not allowed to have a voice at court or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and so they basically just can cancel a whole bunch of, you know, characters on the board for conflicts. So, yeah. And the reason I picked Cunning Magistrate specifically, I think the, the virtues of all of their different, what they care about, um, honor, dishonor, Glory, whatever it is. Even our, our odd numbered cards is like odd cost of cards is the dragon. I, still I think that one's the most creative, to be fair. But I, it's well, weird. I think the name on Enigmatic Magistrate is very apt because I still have no idea if it's good or not. <laughs> um, it's very enigmatic. Mm -hmm. um, but Cunning Magistrate I picked um, because I think the fact that it is a conflict character to me kind of really makes it sing. Because if you have Enigmatic Magistrate on the board um, and your opponent has a basic understanding of math, they're going to look down and go, cool, these are the ones that have even costs or odd costs. These are the ones that are going to mm -hmm. count, and they can kind of plan. This, they go, okay, I do have a lot of Dishonored guys on the board, but it's okay, and, and I'll then, do this. Then and then you, you play, play this, magistrate. and then they're like, oh, and I guess not. And, and you got Way of the Scorpion too, which is a great card in Scorpion. Yeah. It's like one of the most powerful Scorpion cards, I think, in Way of the Scorpion. Uh, that can make this card even more powerful. Yeah. Um, it can also, it also kind of synergizes well with I Can Swim uh, and like you're just going for this whole thing of where this character doesn't count and now it's dead or this yeah. character is dishonored and it's just there's so much cool stuff about this card i think yeah and the other thing is um i'm pretty sure none of the magistrates turn themselves off because i yes. think it specifically says each other character 
Yeah, okay, that's, that's true. I'm pretty sure the way it's templated mm-hmm. means that even if they manage to dishonor your cunning magistrate, you're still getting your two strength. I'm pretty sure. Yep. Uh, the, uh, well, not two because it's dishonor, but I see what well, you're saying. One, yeah, uh, yeah. The the one I chose was haughty magistrate. I'm a I'm, I I like what Phoenix does in this game, and I like, but I feel like their stronghold is a little bit underwhelming sometimes. They'll be getting new ones, but yes. This makes the stronghold very good. So, mm-hmm. um. He, is start, he starts with one glory, so he's good in any situation against zero yeah, glory is, stuff. Right? But solid. giving him two glory with... Is it two or three with the stronghold? It's two. Right? It's two, yeah. Okay, it's two with the stronghold means that any character with three or less glory, which is basically a lot more characters, uh, doesn't count in the conflict. So, And you get to choose to trigger that, too. So it becomes one of those situations of, like, you or your opponent can see that you could do it, but mm-hmm. they don't know if you will do it, right? And that's another decision point that they have to factor in and yeah. the unknown of you doing it or not maybe you don't care maybe you have it for something else because again there are cards that care about phoenix glory it's just not every card that yeah. I, would, I would like it to be <laughs> well my i almost picked this one as well my kind of takeaway on the phoenix and the glory is glory is a is a tough thing to have as you're like we care about blank and, and phoenix has other things they have the elemental rings mm-hmm. they have the spells they have Shigenja. but our thing is glory is hard because glory is not a universally good thing. Having glory, strong glory values, high glory values, is a double-edged sword because it opens up. Hey, if we're honored, we're gonna we're gonna you know take names, and but it also opens up the cool. All your opponent has to do now is dishonor a bunch, and our hollow people have zero strength characters now because they have good glory values. Yeah. So adding things like this in really, I think, kind of helps uh, get rid of that second edge on the sword. So you just have a proper katana with just one edge <laughs> because. Yeah. You know, you you can kind of mitigate the fact that your glory is always doing more for you than it is against, and that's mm-hmm. something I think Phoenix needs. Yeah, so does I think this guy costs more, but does he? No, he's, he's the same. But yeah, I think they're all the same. Anyway, th- those are our feelings there. Maybe. So we got, we're gonna what we're gonna look at next is neutral imperial imperial cards. So this whole cycle is about the mm-hmm. imperial city and things like that. So we got a bunch of really fun and interesting neutral imperial cards, and so the one that Jake chose was censure. Um, Go ahead. It sent censure. <laughs> uh, I think of all the cards revealed, I think spawned the most discussion um, that I saw on you know Facebook groups and Discord and um, you know forums and Reddit. Uh, and it basically everybody knows somebody that only plays you know control deck, blue counter control spell, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, does this resolve? Does this resolve? Does this resolve? And the answer is always no. Um, and so when they saw them printed this, I heard everyone say, "All right, that's there's too many, there's too many cancel effects, there's too many of this, there's too many." Of that. In reality, I think there's, I think maybe it's six fine. cards that cancel. Effects. I don't even think there's six. There's 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 forged there's, edict. There's uh, the crane one. I can't remember the uh, name of honorable no. voice of honor. Voice, yeah, and then censure are the censure. ones that directly co- yeah, cancel. Yeah, and then you effects. have like a you have a Yojimbo in. Uh, Phoenix that cancels it only. But these are yeah. Ninja. So those are ones like, that are there's, on the board there's though. There's some that, situational like, yeah. ones. But the point is, the really cool thing I think in this game is that they're all Did conditional. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't, well, I think I think balance, but they're all conditional. So like in some games, and maybe this is something that this loses a little bit because they're conditional. But you can kind of bluff, right? You mm-hmm. can, like have a card in your hand and leaves a certain amount of resources available and then they're like, oh, if he has a counter spell. You can't really do this with this. If your opponent doesn't have the Imperial favor, they're, you know you're yeah. not getting censured. And that's that goes both ways too. So like if you don't know the card pool well enough, this is a barrier to entry for, for people sometimes because yeah. one of the things that I'll notice about all LCGs, and this isn't just an L5R comment, this is all of them, is that uh, a lot of people who are learning them, who prefer the method of I like to lose to win or to learn, yeah. get mad when sometimes can get angry when they don't know the card pool well enough and they yeah. don't take the time to learn it. And this is one of those cards where you're like, you wouldn't know to look, like to do it unless you would play it a lot. And so, from the perspective of yeah, it's great because it's got imperial favor. Like you also, if you're new, wouldn't know that you should keep that. But that's that's a minor comment. I think uh, k- k- putting things like this on cards is both goes both ways and. This is one of those things I, that's I probably think, more good you, than it is. Bad. I think you have to have it. Yeah, because if some some you know event comes out in the future and it does something and they didn't realize that there's this combo and you just like if it happens it's awful and it leads to you know yep. everybody's playing the you know wombo combo. Uh, no, you're right. Unicorn deck. We, we've all seen games we all that can have put that. censure in there. And, and yeah, it's neutral. 
And, and it's also, to, like you said, it might be a learning experience where you're like, oh, I didn't know I was supposed to contest the imperial favor so that they couldn't censure yeah, me. Yeah, then you care about it. True, <laughs> but you should also already yeah. know that you're supposed to contest the imperial favor for a variety of Thematic reasons. Censure reasons. Censure is just yeah. only one of them. So, yeah. so the fact that it's That's tacked true. onto that mitigates that. I think it's a great yeah. card. I'm glad it's here. I'm sure if you catch certain games of mine in the future, I will be saying things directly to the contrary of that after I get censured, and I'm like, it's horrible, it's imbalanced, I shouldn't have printed it. But while I'm, you know, cooler head, I think it's, I'm glad it's here, and I think it's great, and it's definitely going to be one of the most impactful cards mm. from, the, from the cycle. And one of the cards I thought was really cool from the Imperial standpoint was Imperial Palace. Um, I, I've played a lot of Game of Thrones, I've top four regionals from that game, and this is a card that's very similar to Iron Throne in that game, where it wins you the phase of the game where stuff can can matter in the next phase. So, like, dominance is really important in Game of Thrones. Uh, Imperial Favor is, believe it or not, getting important if it wasn't already. Because there's card again, there's you can censure. If you're winning Imperial yeah. Palace, you can stop people from censuring you. Yeah, you to, can, to answer your question of how do I get to play censure frequently, you can Imperial include Palace. this and that pushes you in that direction. And we talked about some other cards too where I think there's someone there like if you discard favor, you there's a lot of discard favor stuff you can do. It was the district, yeah. right? The district, uh, Koma Ujiaki we talked about mm -hmm. is Imperial. There's almost every clan, well every clan got at least one. I think some of them got two or three. Yeah. Maybe even all of them that like the Imperial Favor is not just a static bonus, it is actually a resource now. And getting plus three to your, your glory count in that phase, is it seems it seems like meh. But that means that you can be all in on characters and still have three, which yeah. requires your opponent to do some serious math and do some serious like thinking about what they want to commit during yeah. that phase. And plus they it's could, a plus two. It could cause them to make not make additional challenges if they want to win glory or if yep. they want to win that stuff. Or yeah. And if, in the future... There could be cards that are developed around winning the Imperial Favor. If you win Imperial Favor, do X. If you do this, yeah, do I X. could I could see Phoenix Synergy coming out that just cares about your glory count value in general. Mm -hmm. Like if it's over a certain amount of gain paid or something, it's a two strength, which like we said earlier on some of the holdings, it's not bad. You're never going to be like, oh god, if only it was, you know, less than two strength, yeah. right? Um, and it's an Imperial card, so if you have this out, um, you have that could be really strong. If you, you have, have <laughs> uh, Mia Satoshi. You have another a magistrate out. Use Mia Satoshi to find your Seppo and Ishikawa, and then you have a, a plus four, a plus four <laughs> dude. Who, you know, so yeah. um, I, that's why I think there's this kind of there's this they're threatening to have this imperial synergy deck come out mm -hmm. um, once somebody smarter than me figures out. How to pull it. <laughs> All right, our next uh, uh, stuff was talking about Shadowlands. So they did introduce a Shadowlands card here. Like uh, this is the breadcrumb I was talking about earlier, where <laughs> like they're. They're saying, oh, we're going to release some, some cool stuff in the future. Just you wait. Uh, here's a goblin to hold, tie you it, over. And the so flavor that. text here is exactly what you're saying. Like, it's the breadcrumb. It says, goblins, impossible. Goblins have never been spotted this far from the wall. And you're and like, yeah. but now they have. Yeah, that's, so. a, that's a theme of the fiction is that, like, you know, everything is kind of in a turbulent. Every clan has their, their thing. The crab or not getting enough jade and seeing the goblins sneak way further than they used to. The mm -hmm. phoenix are worried about Mishoto. The dragon clan have their low birth rates. The, there's a famine. Basically, like, you know, cats and dogs are getting along. Like, everything in Rovigon right now is turbulent, and this is that kind of, like... It's the White Walkers. It's yeah, the, it's, it is. It's, it's that, the, like, the, no, winter, winter isn't wall. coming, mm -hmm. right? You know. And so this card is also cool. I, I like playing this card against my opponent when I, I know they need to have Fae during the yeah. Dynasty phase, and I'm just like, I do this in Scorpion, I have this card in Scorpion, mm -hmm. and I'm just like, boom, okay, so I'm going to be able to have an extra guy. It's not that big of a deal, but he's staying out for an extra turn, and now you can't play with some of the cards that yeah, you wanted to play. Yeah, I've played it in the Dragon, kind of trying to make that uh, Fate Denial, or I cut off your sources of Fate, or I control who has the Fate when kind of theme that Dragon is working on. I've played it in that, and it's fun. I've definitely won some games... Uh, with the help of it, I don't know if it was if I wouldn't have won without the Goblin Sneak, but it's it's definitely useful. I like it. Obviously, I want to see more Shadowland stuff. Mm -hmm. I would love to sit down across the table and like just straight up have somebody be like a Shadowlands deck. Yeah, and it's um, possible because it, or it wasn't an old game. I yeah, believe. it was uh, after a certain amount of time and something. And eventually, they actually turned into a clan with a Spider Clan, <laughs> or, like the, the Shadowlands yeah. clan. But I mean, I'm sure the Crab players are itching to have more Oni to Tetsubo. Yeah. Tetsubo. But, uh, 
to death. And uh, <laughs> personally, but I there's one downside of this card, and that is every time I give it like a katana, I feel so bad that I'm arming the goblins. Yeah, uh, like thematically, you're like, yeah. well, I, should, I shouldn't be doing this. Yeah, like I, I, this is an ancestral dice. I guess though. he's helping you though. I yeah, mean... I, I I think I rationalize it to myself as I didn't bring the goblin to the battle. The enemy was just unlucky enough to run into a goblin running around, also near the battle. And if you did put that on him, the, then maybe the goblin stole it. Yeah, and if he, he dies, he, you get it back, and you're like, "Thank God, I yeah, got this back." I, we, we returned our. <laughs> yeah. So the one I thought I didn't pick a shadow. There's no other Shadowlands card. Yeah, so that's I the picked only one. My favorite Shadowlands art card, which is this Oni getting consumed by the five fires. Uh, this is a cool card in its own right. It's a fire spell, it's secret roll only, which is kind of cool because it exemplifies yeah. that whole secret thing. It does cost five, so this is one of those ones we were talking about earlier. A yeah. five cost event in conflict. And it lets you remove five fate from one characters your opponent controls, which is cool. Yeah, so expensive, yeah. but so such a such a interesting thing. I think I the there's a there's a part of me, and I'm not proud of it, but there's a part of me that as soon as I saw this card, I was like, I'm gonna build a deck, and I'm gonna do this, and it's gonna be hilarious. We need spell we need spell reducers is what we need, and that oh, that would happen in the cheaper. future. Yeah, each I, scholar you have. Yeah, I, I, I guarantee you, some point in this game, we're gonna get a reducer for something. Yeah, and it's gonna help something, but I don't know if it'll be this spell. So it's up to five fate. So yeah. my, my initial thought was that you're gonna you're gonna draw this card, and then you're gonna it's just gonna sit in your hand, and you're just gonna do the <laughs> <laughs> just you wait, right? And it's never gonna go up because you're gonna sit there, and it's gonna be too expensive, and you're like, oh, they only have three fate. Well, see, so I, I want to try it because I want to just like take away three fate with it and see if that feels good, or if you're like, I don't know exactly what the math shakes out on because like. Like we know with attachments, like if it costs zero and it gives you a one one, it's like good, and we, you know. It's, so, but I don't know what the like fate removal. Like I'm trying to think, is there the another event stuff, that yeah. like? Well, the thing I like I about this card is that you could clear a board with it, and that's something that's really powerful when you still have a board state. So like, yeah. if you had it, like, this is the scenario I see being like the the dream. You yeah. have your phoenix. You have a library. You have um, you have maybe you can only have one library, right? I think. One out at once. Yeah. I think it's I think it's unique. You, let's say you have a library, yeah. you have the district, you have another holding, and then you have Imperial Palace. You have all your characters out. You drop this guy in the in the conflict phase. Oh God, you, horrible, you have though. characters out. They have none, and now you can do a bunch of stuff. And I don't know. I just see it being like one of those ones where if you set up your your set it up right, you can really mess up your opponent's next turn because they are going to be out. You're going to have stuff to play because you just discard all your provinces at the so, end. And so everything in this game is ebb and flow. Mm -hmm. If you have a really strong turn this turn. You can expect your next turn to maybe be weaker and your opponent to, right? There's no... It's, it's very much like everything you give, you get. Everything you get, you have to give. And I, I think that's a huge strength of the design. Um, but it does take some getting used to. I'm used to a lot of other games where you just ramp up over time. Mm -hmm. You know, you start with one guy on the board, and by the end, you have all this cool, crazy stuff going off. Um, but with this game, it's very much like, I can all in the first turn, but then, you know... I'm not where. Am I, what am I going to have left to defend the next turn? Because I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to have five guys out, but I don't have any fate and stuff like that. So I don't, I don't know if that's a strategy that can even really be supported in this game. Because I, I think it's possible. I think it's possible. I think personally, I think this is a meme card. Um, a meme card. A meme card. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You're just like you make a meme deck where you're like, I, I totally consumed by five fires this guy, and everybody goes, Oh, that's hilarious. I see um, what you're saying. <laughs> but. I want Oni. Now I want there to be Oni. Right? Cards, that guy's right? cool. There's another one in some picture somewhere. But let's move on to the next thing. So uh, there's two things that we wanted to talk about that were introduced in this cycle that uh, we both thought were cool. Um, the first is dueling. And so, yeah. uh, Jake, why don't you talk about dueling for a few minutes and we can move on yeah, to Yeah, so I, like I said things. earlier, um, I built a. It was a dragon, crane splash. If the card said the word duel, I put it in. Mm -hmm. And it was, it, I thought it was just a riot to play, to just go through. And like, you could see, like, when I had my, um, uh, the duelist, the, uh, Raitsugu, the Miramoto, I think Miramoto, I understood. Right, yeah. uh, the duelist. And when I, when I had that on the board, the, the people just across from me would be like, they would just look at me and go, and just like pick up their dial and just get ready to like <laughs> lose a duel. Too. Um, and, and, like, I don't know, I found that really fun. Also, like, um, when I taught one of my friends a game and I taught him about dueling, um, like, his eyes just lit up when I was like, okay, so you have to pick a number on your dial, 
and whoever loses the duel is this is gonna happen and he's like so you're just gonna he like very confidently was just like well you're gonna bid this because and then he stopped and he's like but wait if, if you I bid this, this then whatever and then like and then like i just got <laughs> to watch like the the mind games like and i was just like this is fun i want to do this more and this is the first time that they let you do this with politics yeah um, and the effect is worth it. It's a solid effect. It's a zero cost card, which is um, the correct cost for, yes. for, for most, a, yeah. most things in your And I like effect. that it's a, du a the duel is zero cost. So, like, the whole idea of dueling was a big thing in the first L5R. Dueling yes. was crazy in yeah. the original L5R. And they're, they're slowly putting stuff out there that lets you duel. You don't want to go crazy like, with yeah. it. I understand why. It could slow down the game. Mm -hmm. It could. And also, so let's, let's be 100% honest. In real Bushido you know, honor, com, you know, honorable samurai, you're, you're not running around dueling people that you know you can beat with no effort yeah. because you would be, you know, shunned by society. But in L5R dueling, you pick the crappiest person they have and you make them fight your best guy and it's hilarious. And it's, and so like, like this Kikari, uh, Katakita blade that we're saying here, that card, that strategy is a good way to actually get honor. Like, yeah. Now they're adding cards that yep. don't just care about, don't just initiate a duel, but care about when you're yep. dueling and care about what's happening in the duel. And that's that's a really cool thing for the future of this game because yeah. it it's a design space that like they'll probably spend a cycle exploring. I bet. I bet. Yeah, um, I could definitely see, or like a really like I could see because one thing they did in the old L five R that I'm really hoping they continue in the new five R is things that happen at tournaments. And things that you know players in decide impact the story. Mm -hmm. Like there was there was whole cards in if, if any if anyone's seen uh, Matthew Colville's uh, he's like a big you know D and D how to DM YouTube channel. If you see his story about his relationship with the old five R, he goes into this um, really cool thing that happened where like a specific person used a specific character to win mm -hmm. at a tournament, and then they like printed cards that like reflected. Yeah, that. and that was a big deal. That was a like, big that deal. Was a thing, and that's kind of happening with the keeper seeker rules and things determining there, and so that's what we get now. I want to see a really later. big impactful duel happen at some world's tournament or something, and have that, it be like immortalized. Yeah, and, like, that would be that's cool. what I want to see happen. So uh, that the thing. So that was one of the things we thought was kind of cool in this is that dueling got a little bit. More yeah, got a little bit of a bump. Um, I thought personally that Shrine Maiden was a card that was very interesting. Um, now yes. Jake has built this deck and said it didn't work very well, but I, I it don't, was fun. I don't necessarily think that this is a deck that can work now. I think it's interesting that they're combining things. So spells in Phoenix go hand in hand. Yeah, monks and Kehos go hand in hand. But this is a Phoenix card that's a monk and can do Kehos stuff. So like yeah. the design space around there is kind of interesting because you've now thrown in keywords from other factions that. Like can be work can work together, and yeah. this card is a one one one. That's not that bad. It's zero glory, no, so it's, it's, it's fair. Not terrible. It's fair. Um, but there are some pretty cool like like supernatural storm and um and like know the world and display of power can all be used in dragon with phoenix or you know mm -hmm. vice versa. And you also have your mantras that are the keyhose that you can pull out. And now yeah. you don't want to go too hard. And there's some stuff about how this deck may not work very well, but it's interesting to see them kind of take these themes and pull them into one card to be like yeah. here's a card that. Now, if you have, if this, like, here's a card that will matter later. Yes. Yeah. This maybe, card has to matter later. Maybe it goes in your spell heavy deck. Maybe it goes in your monk heavy deck. Mm -hmm. Maybe it goes in, you know, uh, Dragon Splash Phoenix. Maybe it goes in Phoenix Splash Dragon. Maybe yeah. it goes in. Um, so when it came out, I built, I ran, ran home. I, I think I was probably already at home when I <laughs> learned about the card coming out. But I built the deck because I was like, I want there to be a monk deck. I love monks. Um, so I was like, cool, I'm going to put this in, I'm going to put all the keyhoes, I'm going to put in all the rest of my influence value is going to be spells I'm going to put in. I did uh, Embrace the Void, yeah, um, which is good in Dragon. If you have Shigenjus, so like I, I was like thinking about that too, yeah. so I tried to pull things I didn't care about Shigenjus, but that's something you can totally design into if you want. Well, because dragons have Agasha Swordsmith, mm -hmm. they have their champion is a Shigenja. Dragon has good Shigenja support, so I was like, sweet, this is going to be awesome. And what happened was, was two things. When I pulled the keyhoes, they sat in my hand sometimes because... The opponent doesn't always declare them, and mm -hmm. I never drew enough court games, I never drew enough bonsais, <laughs> so I never drew enough You didn't have enough of the stuff you actually to get have the to gas have in the, game in the right tank now. to really yeah. win the game. One, and then two, I put down a shrine main once, and you know maybe I have rose colored glasses on for some of this stuff. But when I read the card initially, I didn't realize it discards the yeah. things that are not. That's so I like literally like threw three like really important cards court away. Games, court games, court, court games, court like, games, like, no. ancestral die show, uh, like Miramoto's Fury, like turn one, and I'm just like. Oh, 
Yeah, so this is that's exactly why I think that there's gonna have there's something that, there's space in the future for this card to actually care. So sometimes discarding cards can be good in games where that well, you can recur is good. or you can pull yeah. things out. And so have, yeah. or maybe you play it cheaper because it's in the discard pile. Yep. There's things like that yep. too. So but you have to get it there. So yeah. there's things that this card could really it really points to me as being uh, the the way they combine the traits, the the fact that it's discarding cards from your conflict deck. The, the interest play effect of like of tutor of kind of tutoring stuff mm -hmm. in your hand it's all kind of interesting to me but just the design space when thing. I learned that they were doing the clan packs and there's gonna be a Phoenix pack mm -hmm. then I was like that's what this card was for yeah. I thought the card they had you know listened to me in my dreams and they were like oh we're gonna print a monk synergy <laughs> mantra Kiho deck where you play all the Kehoes once and you play some enlightenment card and win the game on some improbable <laughs> combo. I was like, thanks guys. And then it turns out what it actually is is them, I think, prepping for the clan yeah. packs and way more impactful maybe Phoenix, Mon, Kehoes mm -hmm. that are not actually and, and more monks. And so then I was like, okay, so I just, I jumped the gun on this deck but I still believe in my heart somewhere there's a really cool Shrine Maiden deck. Yeah. Um, and in again, you can never build a deck around one character because there's only three copies. You can but try repeatedly. You, you can like you do. can try though, and so it's good to keep in mind that like this is not this is a card that makes a deck better, not the not yeah. like you can yeah anyway yeah personal experience <laughs> keep that in mind. Uh, so the last thing we're going to talk about is cards that have really cool future synergies or things that mm -hmm. we thought are yeah. uh, just like the Shrine Maiden kind of work are going to work better yeah. in the future. Um, uh, this is Jake's pick, uh, Sawakade. So this is kind of actually my runner-up for five-cost champion. Uh, it's just nuts. The card is nuts. Um, I want it in all of my decks, regardless of if they're Phoenix. Um, but sadly, that's not meant to be. Just because the uh, the immunity to ring effects is huge. Mm -hmm. The Just getting to on-demand use the Void Ring is huge. The being able to resolve multiple ring effects is at once is huge. huge for Phoenix, and the stats are fair, yeah. and the glory value is huge. So Yeah, yeah that's the one I was looking at, too. <laughs> it's just like a great Phoenix card, and when I saw this, I literally was like almost like, well, I guess I have to play Phoenix now, because <laughs> um, I like Phoenix, and I, I had almost, you know, went all in on Phoenix when it first came out, um, even just in the core, so this was great, and... Um, this card, with the stuff that we're seeing coming out, the reason I picked it for the future is with the clan pack, like, the whole theme of Phoenix care about which rings to play, it's not that it was underdeveloped by any means. I think there's a ton of great cards oh, that yes. trigger off that. But just, like, that's such, in my opinion, a fun play style. Mm -hmm. Where, like, because you have all these moving parts in this game, you have you can't just say, I'm going to attack you. You have to say, I'm going to attack you, I'm going to attack you here, I'm going to attack you using politics, and I'm going to make this a fire conflict. So there's a lot of decisions in the conflict phase, and making those really sing, making those uh, decisions very impactful, and uh, for me, it's just a huge um, strength of the way this game was designed, and I know that this card and the other, you know, ring effect cards are going to combo so well with the cards in the clan pack, and we're going to see... Because right now they do so well anyway, I mean, yeah. know the just world... Just expanding that theme, it's is, just like, yes, yeah. more, give me more yeah, of this it's... theme, and I think Asawa Kaede, and the art's great, and uh, I like the Void Shugenja because they're the, the like the prophets and they like yeah. look into the future. Because um, there's another Void Shugenja. That's a ch the champ. The champion's not a Void Shugenja, but there is another Void Shugenja that yeah, minus ones, the, minus ones, and plus ones, plus uh, ones. Like Ishikawa Initiate or there's one it's a, there's like, another champion because it's the one that like gives everybody minus two minus two or it gives you plus one plus one and then minus one minus one. There's another one, but Katsuka, the, I don't know. the uh, yeah, I I honestly think Phoenix is a good clan to. I'm gonna say I'm gonna think they're a good clan to start with, just because having saying the contested like when start you're attacking with, to, like, with this one, game? yeah, because what they allow so. you do is is to say okay, I know I need to attack with this ring to get this guy's effect, which means that you get forced, you can be forced into if you don't know the game yet, you you're forced into a way of playing because of what the cards say, I and th and that to me makes yeah, it so that's how I, I don't think like they should be your first. I think they were very good on the lion crane or like learn with lion crane, but I think like a good. I want to deep dive into the mechanics and learn. Sure, sure. Would be Phoenix. I think you're right. I started. I think I started with like, like Crane or whatever the opening decks were. But I, as soon I, as I, I played Phoenix, one I of my new friends like a Phoenix deck yeah. because I was the, the decks I had on me were just the decks that I was playing, and it was like one Dragon, one Phoenix, or it was like Unicorn Phoenix, and um, yeah, I think it was Unicorn sub Dragon and like Phoenix sub something else. And I handed him the Phoenix deck, and I remember like 
multiple times where he just looked up from his hands of cards at me and he's like, I need to ask you how... A, 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 I have a rules question <laughs> okay, for every fair. card in my hand. If you're playing 1v1 and you're teaching, don't play Phoenix with the other but person. But once, once you decide, you're like, I really want to tear this game open and learn how all the little gears mesh together, build some Phoenix decks. Because Again, because Phoenix will sometimes force you into making a ring decision and you'll get to feel what that ring does in the game yeah. because of it. And so the one I chose was Gaijin Customs because when I saw this card come out, I laughed a little bit because I thought it was funny. Yeah. Because... Uh, as a, as a meat eating there, yeah. gaijin <laughs> myself, it's I it's you know I see myself in it, and I like the fact that it it's a card that's like let's let's do cross faction stuff, let's dive deeper into putting cards that are outside of my faction into this thing, and again I learned earlier that the, the unicorn card is a oh, the yeah. unicorn stronghold yeah, yeah, is a yeah. unicorn card, so this card always triggers unicorn. So yeah, go my, ahead. my instinct when I saw it was what would I splash Unicorn into that I would then want to unbow my Unicorn cards? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, sure, but the important thing is if you're playing Unicorn, your Stronghold's a Unicorn card, you always can activate Gaijin Customs. You never have it in your hand. So it's basically unbow a non-Unicorn character. And uh, the thing that I learned recently, I think it's, it's spoiled, I'm assuming it's legit and official. Um, obviously we will be patient and see what uh, <laughs> FFG does. But in the clan packs, they're going to have new roles that are literally ally of the blank so that means you can like get way more, you do you can't do keeper cards you can't do seeker cards i don't even think you have an element so i don't even think you can do like fire roll only mm -hmm. cards um you're not going to get i don't think the fate from like the stuff so you're giving up a lot but what you're getting is basically a hybrid deck where you can do a ton of influence in, in a different conflict, plan yeah. so with this being on the table like if your deck is half lion anyway half lion have unicorn and you always have the unicorn stronghold in play like this could be just bonkers and um, this card works with neutrals too because neutrals are non-character non-unicorn yeah. so like if you're running that imperial deck we're talking about yeah. you could easily throw in you know maybe one of your favorite side factions manage magistrates or no yeah. if you do you, you, you can, can go do like scorpion and, or you like, do scorpion magistrates, and then yeah. you can like get a lot of bonuses from just running imperial yeah. cards so. so i think it's it's a good sign for the future that they printed this mm -hmm. i saw a lot of people when when it was a was announced uh, i think it was in the the article that ffg uh, posts when they go over what it's going to be in the pack, which is which are great resources for to check out if you like me are mm -hmm. always uh, itching to learn about what's around the horizon. Um, but they, a lot of people are like, oh, more bad stuff for unicorn, <laughs> and I was like, I don't think it's bad. I don't know. It's it's one of those cards where um, I've seen people putting this in unicorn decks now mm -hmm. because unicorn decks use a lot of neutral characters. You need a yeah. lot of you know, neutral courtiers and stuff like that. So I think it's good, but it's I think it's very emblematic of where I think the game is going to go mm -hmm. with the allied clans and things like that. And um, so I think it's one of those things where kind of like the seals where I looked at it, and I'm like, is this good? And then it's like, and like maybe not now, <laughs> but but they have a plan. Yeah, they, they're not just releasing this and you know, there's never going to be another mm -hmm. support for it. This they have invested in this game. There's going to be a long lifespan. I think that's awesome. Yeah. All right, so that's our last one. That was our Imperial Cycle review. Thanks for uh, listening to us talk. Or thanks for listen, watching Tales of Rokugan. Um, like, comment, subscribe to the video if you liked it. Let us know what you didn't like, because this is a long video. So yeah. um, I might try to mark it. I don't really know how I'm going to do it yet, but uh, there's a lot of different things we went over. And um, Usually, those will be shorter. We'll probably do pack reviews as well. So pack reviews will probably be in the normal like 20, 30 minutes. Um, if you like the Cycle review, let us know, and we'll do it again. If you don't, then let us know we won't yeah. do it again. <laughs> we, we, uh, we, they, they came out with this, you know, back to back to back to back yeah. to back. So it was kind of like the first time we had to catch our breath and really look at what was in all the packs was when they were all out. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't have that, like, get this and ha you have three weeks to. So um, I liked it a lot, though, for the health of the meta. And the, yeah. I think that was a good strategy. Yeah, especially since the core sets usually have are so limited. And mm -hmm. if you had to wait six months to play, the, the yeah. game would I think it was a good decision. I'm glad they did it. Uh -huh. um, but video wise it'll yeah. probably change so um if you play these games at all come down on tuesdays or saturdays and come play at collector mania if you play them wherever you're playing go to your local stores and see where they play or you know look online to see where you know people play l5r there's a ton of communities reddit there's card game db the fantasy flight forums are a good yeah, place I, I found that local areas almost all tend to have a facebook group mm -hmm. um there is the, the subreddit is going to be hard to reach to find local players in your area 
um, just because you you know put a post there and people from all around the world literally <laughs> are reading it. But the, they have a Discord, so mm-hmm. you can do that. Um, Facebook, I think is. Uh, well, we have a Facebook group yeah, too for our absolutely. shop. So Collector Mania FFG Card Games is our Facebook group. Amazing name, I came up with it. It's fantastic. <laughs> but uh, join that, and you'll know anything we're doing. Uh, we're, we run monthly events here too. Current champion with Scorpion uh, of our last event. So come beat me because I'm. He's played Scorpion. Yeah. That's enough reason to want to beat someone. <laughs> I think it was Scorpion. Um, so come on down if, you, if you're if you in the town. If not, uh, we hope to see you next time. And let us know if you liked it. Do all that stuff. Uh, thanks for watching.